Chapter 2.3 derives the steady state heat transfer equation. We'll consider a slab geometry as before with heat transferring only in the x direction and that's perpendicular to the large surface area of this slab. Uh, it's very important that because x is the direction of heat transfer that the coordinate x be defined incrementally. Um, in terms of x and x plus delta x. Uh, the other dimensions, the y and z directions, doesn't really matter if we define them as small differential units or not. Uh, we also have a heat generation term that's uniform within the volume of the slab. So in order to derive the heat equation, we have to start by assuming that all of the sides are insulated so that heat is only transferring in the x direction and we'll perform an energy balance on the heat that's transferring. And this is every chemical engineer's mantra, accumulation equals in minus out plus generation. So at steady state, we have no accumulation term. That simplifies things a little bit for us. And we're going to use the units of watts because that's energy per time. At steady state, uh, there's no appreciable difference in the amount of energy that's transferred in one time increment versus another, if it's the same time increment value. So basically using watts is getting us to that energy balance. To actually make this happen, we're going to multiply the flux by the area. So the flux going into the slab at x times that area minus the flux coming out of the slab at x plus delta x. And then we're going to add to that the generation term multiplied by the volume of the slab. We see for this particular problem, A is constant for both of those surfaces. And it's basically just delta Y multiplied by delta Z. Similarly, the volume of the slab is delta X, delta Y, delta Z. So given those definitions, we're going to plug them back into our energy balance. And so we get a slightly longer expression with lots of uh, differential lane scales, but we can divide by delta x, delta y, delta z. And when we do that, most things cancel out and all we're left with is that one delta x in the denominator of the heat flux term. So if we take the limit as delta x goes to zero, this is looking a lot like a derivative. And indeed, it's the negative derivative of q with respect to x. And when we take the limit, of course, it has no effect on qv. So this is a very useful form of the heat equation, but we're gonna take it one step further because there's no temperature term here. So we need to substitute into that expression the definition of Q from Fourier's law, and that introduces our temperature dependence on X into the heat equation. Uh, we can easily cancel the negatives, but we're gonna leave that K inside the brackets because there are situations when K is not independent of spatial position, and so it would be incorrect to remove it. There are two limiting cases though, if k is constant, you can pull it outside of the brackets, not a problem. In a lot of examples also, we're not going to have generation. And so the equation, the heat equation, collapses onto this very simplified form, which is known as the Laplace equation. So now that you know how to use differential shells to derive the heat equation, let's go ahead and do exercises four and five.